Well, the neurology of sexual addictions or sexual uh, obsessions is um, relatively new. I mean, not new in that it hasn't been around for a while, but a lot of the technology has gotten us to a place where we can really get some nice images of the brain when it's being stimulated. And we've been able to, to scan brains and be able to see what stimulated brains look like over a long period of time when it comes to addictions and things like that. Um, we're able to understand the neurochemistry the neurotransmitters that are um, produced in the brain during times of acting out and that sort of thing. And so some of the stuff that's come out sort of to, to give you a, a shorter Reader's Digest version of, um, of, neuro, of neuro, the neurology of addictions is that there's, some com there's, there's several transmitters that are really important in addictions. One of them is um, probably the, the most important one is dopamine. Uh, which is the sort of I gotta have it drug. It gives you the sense of euphoria. You know, people that jump out of planes love dopamine, things like that. Um, and then there's serotonin, which is uh, a mood stabilizer. Uh, most antidepressants act on serotonin, so it, it helps with mood. And, and then there's um, also oxytocin, which um, is called the, the cuddle hormone or the attachment hormone, the one that makes you feel um, a sense of peace when you're feeling connected with someone else and close. And so, and there's also adrenaline that's a part of it too. So, so you have these four main neurotransmitters that act when you're being sexual. Um, when you're being sexual outside of intimacy, the m most dominant neurotransmitter is dopamine. And um, that's kind of this feeling of, that's part of what takes you away from all the things that you are feeling because you get this dopamine rush through your body. And, you know, a lot of it is in anticipation of the, of the image and then it's seeing the image and then it's always acting out. And, this flood of dopamine, it feels fantastic, and you know, you're not aware of all your sadness, your sorrow, and your life stressors, and all that. It's kind of you're almost in this artificial state because of the production of dopamine. And the tricky thing about it is that you know, most addictions are things you inject into your body. Um, you have to go get it, you have to snort it, you have to drink it, you have to do whatever with it. Where sexual addictions, you're your own pharmacy. And so you're using these natural chemicals in your body to be able to stimulate this sense of euphoria. And dopamine has been most closely compared to cocaine. In fact, um, in you know, sort of uh, scans of the brain, you can see that scans of a coke addict and that of someone who's been addicted to dopamine through addictions looks very similar as far as the way the brain is shaped and the way it looks um, and the damage that happens in the brain as a result of that. So it is really as close as you can tell to kind of like this cocaine addiction. Um, gives very similar feelings to that, but yet produced in the body. Um, <clears throat> oxytocin is sort of the chemical that's released in the body when we feel a sense of closeness or connection. Um, it's also a huge part of the birthing process for mothers. It's released at huge levels when uh, mothers are giving birth and it, it prompts them to reach down and hold their babies close to them and for their heartbeats to synchronize and all this sort of beautiful sense of connection. Well, that, that, uh, that transmitter is still in the body as adults and we experience that when we experience intimacy with other people and closeness and sexuality. And so it's, it's also a chemical that kind of tempers our need for dopamine and um, gives us a sense of closeness, for instance, following sex and that sort of stuff, um, as opposed to this sort of dopamine hangover that can happen Without, this, without the presence of oxytocin as being part of the experience. So addicts will get really addicted to dopamine. Um, and what does dopamine do to the brain? Well, dopamine, um, it saturates the brain to where the brain has to make adjustments if there's too much dopamine. And uh, neurotransmitter sites um, end up, they end up dying off or they end up receding from the brain. And so you need more dopamine to feel the same level of excitement. And this is what's called tolerance. And so that's why an addict, you know, one image two weeks ago doesn't do the same thing for them today. And so dopamine starts burning the brain out. Um, and I've had people ask, is this reversible? Yeah, absolutely. The brain will adjust and will create new neurotransmitter sites to take on dopamine if we go through times of abstinence. And there's, there's two different, this is also part of treatment. Um, oftentimes addicts will go through times of either um, total abstinence, which is typically around you know 65 to 72 days, or they'll do moderation contracts where they will uh, moderate the amount of sexual contact that they have. So maybe it's like Monday through Monday through su uh, Sunday, they they don't have any sort of sexual contact, and then Sundays is sort of the feasting of that. Um, but either I've seen success for either one. But the idea is to sort of um, take in the dopamine in moderation, the way it was designed, rather than in these huge doses, which ends up destroying the brain and really ends up creating problems in the prefrontal cortex, which is the most relational part of our brain. It's also the brakes of our brain. And so, um, so, so it has a destructive mechanism in that. I think it's fascinating because you, know, you think about it, oh, that's just kind of a pervert or whatever else when you think about addictions. That's easy to think those things but not really understand that there's, a, there's a neuroscience happening behind all of this. And um, there's these amazing brain scans that show what a brain looks like ever it's been exposed.
too high levels of dopamine that comes through sexual addictions, and it's really destructive. It can really create problems for the brain to be able to operate normally. And again, I think it ends up looking very ADD-like, um, you know, as the brain um, is impacted. And the brain is always impacted by the chemicals that are introduced into the brain. Um, so we end up being more, what's kind of, kind of called, we end up being more reflexive in that. We are more monitored by our amygdala, which is where emotions lie, and we're more driven by our impulses than we are by the front of our brain that slows ourselves down, that takes, gives the information back to amygdala that says, hey, this is not what you want to do. This is not a good choice. Um, and those, those, the capacity to be able to do that begins to be affected as the brain begins to change. Um, but the brain is neuroplasticity, and so it's changing all the time. And so, you know, if, if you're struggling with addiction and your brain is kind of making this adjustment and it can be readjusted back to, um, to pretty healthy levels. But again, you know, I mean, neuroscience is still really at its beginning of understanding the brain and as it relates to uh, addictions, as it relates to other types of um, psychological disorders. And so, you know, in the next 10 years, we're going to know a lot more. And maybe this, in the next 10 years, we'll be looking at this video and saying, wow, you know, things we know even more now than we knew then, and we can fill in some more gaps. But for now, it's really promising. Um, and there are some suggestions in the field that within five or 10 years, you know, all mental health diagnoses will be able to be um, monitored, evaluated, and confirmed through um, through scanning of the brain, just by looking at the brain and saying this part of the brain is overdeveloped, underdeveloped, and this is where depression lands, this is where anxiety lands. And they're, and they're already able to pinpoint where all these things land on the brain, and now it's just understanding it even better. So I think for the addict to to understand that that you know it's 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 a rewiring of the brain too, and there's been some some stuff that's been out there that suggests that the brain can rewire itself, um, but some images that are viewed and are seem to always will always be there will be stored in this folder in the brain and um, as long as it's not being used as long as the brain's not accessing that folder then the connections become weaker and weaker and that the brain can create new neurological connections to the body of responses to images and stuff which i think is pretty cool i think you know sexuality when it's not paired with intimacy you know produces such <clears throat> high levels of dopamine that um, there's conversation in the field about dopamine hangovers and these hangovers, you know, can depending on the person, can last, you know, up to two weeks. Um, and usually, it's you know, this dopamine drop after the dopamine spike, um, which then has an impact on the other neurochemicals in the body, and the person can end up feeling somewhat depressed or lethargic. And it, it sometimes is hard to separate, you know, what's actually depression and dopamine hangover, and what's just shame from having acted out. And I think that the hangover can contribute to the shame. The shame can contribute to the hangover. And I think that's part of the, the real low that comes. Um, and so what, you know, so what does someone do when they feel that? Well, they gotta get out of it. And so there's a compulsion to go back to the addiction to get them out of the way that they're feeling because it's too, it's too overwhelming. You know, it feels too, um, it's too painful. And so they'll go back to the addiction to numb themselves out with more dopamine. You know, and every time they go back to it, they're further burning the brain out. Um, and creating more neurological problems for them. I mean, I think you know, neurotransmitters are intended to be used in moderation, like most things in life. You know, moderation seems to be the healthiest. And so, you take dopamine and you overdo it, then you know your your brain's going to be impacted by it, and your moods will be impacted by it because it's a, you know, it's it's part of regulating mood. Dopamine is, and so the serotonin, of, in and of itself, dopamine it's a wonderful thing it gives us energy, gives us motivation, it gives us drive to do things. Um, but when used and overused. Um, it can create real problems for the brain. And with a sexual addict, that's, a, that's one big problem for them is the overuse of dopamine.